I would like to extend with all of you my love and welcome to these new general authorities. And my greatest desire and wish for them is that they will get as much joy and happiness out of their service as I have had in 40 years since I was sustained as one of the general authorities of the church. I thought today I'd like to refer to the fact that a week ago today, the entire Christian world celebrated one of the greatest, if not the greatest, event that has transpired in this world since the foundation thereof were laid, and that was the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. No wonder after the apostles had seen him crucified and laid away in the tomb when the women brought the report that he was, uh, had arisen from the dead, that they felt like it was idle tales. And as Jesus walked along the way with two of his disciples on the way to Emmaus following his resurrection, and we're told that their eyes were holding, that they didn't recognize him. And when he heard what they had to say about him, and his life and crucifixion, he realized that they didn't uh, understand all that the prophets had said concerning him. Uh, and so he said, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And commencing with Moses and the prophets, he showed them how that in all things that they had testified of him. And that they did even to the minutest details, even to the casting lots for his clothing at the time of his crucifixion. And Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy, and we do well that we cleave unto it, as unto a light shining in a dark place, till the day star in our heart arise in our hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in olden times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved upon by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, if prophecy is the most sure way of knowing what's to happen, and Isaiah said that the Lord had declared the end from the beginning, it's all there when we understand it. And so I think that if Jesus pronounced such judgment upon those who failed to understand the scriptures relating to his first coming, how would he feel toward us and the world if we fail to recognize the value of the words of the holy prophets relating to his second coming. And so I thought I'd like to just mention one or two of the things that the prophets have foretold. First, I think of the words of Peter when he said that the, following the day of Pentecost as he talked to those who had put to death the Christ, he said, repent ye therefore and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send unto you Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the time of the restitution of all things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. This is the only church, I'm sure, that believes in such a restitution of all the things that the holy prophets have spoken. Other churches believe in a reformation, but that's only man's wisdom. Restitution comes from God, the eternal Father. And um, so uh, we can't look forward to the second coming of the Savior without there should be a restitution of all things. And that's the message of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
Um, I'd like to refer now to the prophecies of just one of the holy prophets. There isn't time to discuss more than that. And I choose for my, for my, the text for my talk today of the signs that are to precede his second coming, the words of Malachi, the prophet, the last prophet recorded in the Old Testament. The Lord speaking through Malachi said that he would send his messenger to prepare the way for his coming and he would come swiftly to his temple and who could abide the day of his coming because he would be as refiner's fire and fuller's soap. Now obviously that had no reference to his first coming. He didn't come swiftly to his temple and all men were able to abide his first coming. But we're told that when he comes in power and great glory of all the holy angels, the wicked shall cry out, let the rocks fall upon us to hide us from his presence. And uh, you'll remember that Jesus, uh, when he told his disciples how that the temple should be broken down and that should not be one stone left upon another, they inquired, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? That would be his second coming and the end of the world. And Jesus told them of the wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes and famines and nations should rise against nation. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and all men. And then shall the end come. And then he told them that as the days of Noah were, so should be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They should be eating and drinking and making merry and say that the Lord delayeth his coming and then he would come as a thief in the night. And he said there would be two men upon the land. One should be taken and the other should be left. Two women would be grinding at the meal. One would be taken and the other would be left. All of that was what the Savior said to identify the signs that would precede his second coming. Then the next thing that Malachi, besides seeing the messenger sent, and incidentally, when the Lord sends a messenger, that messenger can be none other than a prophet. Jesus bore witness that John the Baptist, who was sent as a messenger, to prepare the way for his coming in the meridian of times, he said that there was no prophet in Israel greater than John the Baptist. And the prophet Amos said, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. How then could all things be restored that Peter said from all the holy prophets from the days of Adam down without there was a prophet to receive such restitution. And that prophet was none other than Joseph Smith, who under the direction and divine guidance and authority from the Father and the Son organized this great church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The second thing that Malachi saw relating to the preparation for the coming of the Savior in the latter days, he said that the whole house of Israel had uh, departed from him, and they wanted to know how. And he said, in the paying of your tithes and your offerings, he said, even this whole house of Israel has robbed me. And then he said, bring your tithes into my storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me therewith and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings until you will not, not have room to receive them. What an invitation when the Lord extends to Israel in the latter days as preparation for his coming to return to him in the payment of their tithes and their offerings. And then he goes a little further and said that he would Rebuke the devourer for their sakes, that their crop should not fall before its time, and that all men should call them blessed. 
We are a blessed people. The Lord has blessed us after the driving of our pioneers a thousand miles from transportation, and they landed, landed here in this wilderness, and Isaiah saw that the Lord would cause the wilderness to blossom as the rose. He saw the rivers flow in the desert and flow down from the high places to hear it make this land productive. And why? So that the saints and they are gathered here could fulfill the promises. For if this gospel that Jesus referred to was to be preached in all the world, it had to be done by his children. And hundreds of thousands of Latter-day Saint missionaries since that time have been sent all over the world, some 25,000 of them at the present time to declare the restoration of the gospel as one of the steps in the preparation for the return of the Savior, for he so indicated that it must be preached in all the world. And then there's so many other things that needed to be done that required money in order to build the, temp the uh, kingdom of God in the earth, like the building of our places of worship, these beautiful buildings that you see here in this city, this great metropolis, all of this because the Lord has truly blessed his people. And then the building of holy temples for those that are now on the drawing boards, I think a total of 50, and we're the only, no, 20, and we're the only temple building people in this whole world. And if they were to build them, they wouldn't know what to do with them. And that brings us to one more, <laughs> that brings us to one more thing that Malachi saw. He said, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, I will send you Elijah the prophet, and he will turn the heart of the father to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the whole earth with the curse. Just think of all that the Malachi saw in the coming when he saw Elijah. What a consequence if it were not for his coming. The Lord said that the whole earth would be utterly wasted. Nobody in this world, I'm sure, outside of this church could tell you what the message of Elijah was, and we wouldn't know either, but Elijah came and appeared to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cadbury on the third day of April, 1836 in the, uh, in the Kirtland Temple. And as a result of that, and the keys of the dispensation that Elijah brought, we built all these holy temples. We understand the value of genealogical research until we built here in this city, genealogical library and these great vaults out in the mountains, uh, a miracle in and of itself, nothing else like it in the entire world. And all of that is to fulfill the mission of Elijah, lest he come, uh, lest the Lord come and smite the whole earth with a curse. Well, Go through now the Bible. We're advised to study the scriptures, the, the older scriptures and the modern scriptures, and just see what the prophets have said, and then remember the words of Peter, that we have a more sure word of prophecy, and that we do well, that we cleave unto it. And I want to bear you my testimony here that this is the work of God, the Eternal Father. And as I on the as I stand here as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bear you my witness that the prophecies of Malachi that I've referred to have been fulfilled in the restoration of the gospel at the hands of the prophet Joseph Smith and the holy prophets who have succeeded him at the head of this church, even to our present prophet, President Spencer W. Kimball, whom I honor with all my heart, as I do all my brethren of the general authorities. So I leave with you that witness and pray God to give us the strength and the faith to do our part in the preparation of his kingdom in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>